City University Television presents the American Theatre Wing Seminars. Working in the theater. This seminar, playwright, director, choreographer. Welcome to the American Theatre Wings Working in the Theatre Seminars, coming to you from the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. Now, in their 30th year, these seminars give you the opportunity to learn from the professionals as they share their experiences in working in the theatre. Today's seminars are the panel of playwrights, directors, and choreographers. These are the artists who provide the creative heart of the theatre, and it's their work that we learn about while we discover how the magic of the theater is created. I'm Isabel Stevenson, chairman of the board of the American Theatre Wing. And now I would like to introduce our moderator for the seminar, the distinguished critic, professor, and editor of the Best Plays book series, and a member of the Wing's advisory committee, Jeffrey Eris Jenkins. Jeffrey. Thank you, Isabel. Robert Anderson famously remarked that you can't make a living in the theater, but you can make a killing. <laughs> the people who are with us today, though, have found ways to make <clears throat> lives in the theater. I don't know about any killings that might or might not have been made along the way. I want to start by introducing to you our distinguished panel of playwrights, directors, and choreographers. Our first uh, guest is Jonathan Butterell, choreographer, Teresa Rebeck, playwright, Arthur Copet, playwright, Susan H. Schulman, director, and Joey McNeely, choreographer. Now, I think we'll start first with Jonathan Butterell, one of our movement specialists today. <laughs> Uh, you know, I know that you have a couple of Broadway credits, and you're going to be the choreographer of the upcoming production of Fiddler on the Roof, the revival of Fiddler on the Roof that's due to come into the Minskoff, I think, is where it's going. That's right. And uh, David Laveau is the director of that, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct, yes. And what I'm also interested in, though, is I noticed that you were um, credited for movement in Electra, in the production of Electra, the Zoe Wanamaker production of Electra a few years ago. And I'm just fascinated by how... Uh, that came about as part of your choreographic work. Um, the director of that production was David Laveau, again, right. who I started a relationship when I worked at the Donmore Warehouse when we did Nine together. Uh, this production of Nine that's now on Broadway right. started its original life back in London on, at the Donmore Warehouse. And we found a way of working that was kind of integral, that we found a way of that there wasn't a place that I was looking in one direction, he was looking in another, we both were looking in the same place. And he asked me to come and work on a lecturer. And the one of the, I remember somebody saying, who came to see a lecture, there's very little movement in this. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, that wasn't my role. It's what was wonderful about what one person said was actually, he said, I remember seeing, seeing the chorus of people, of which there were only three, and one, one time they'd be over there, and then the next time I looked or blinked, that person had somehow got over to there, and I never saw that happen. So there was practically no movement at all in the show, and I said, that's movement. <laughs> right. Um, it's I present, but it's absent at the same time. It's actually just about communicating stories, the thing we all do. And my responsibility was to help and enable David to tell that story. And I work with the actors very closely and working with their bodies and particularly getting a sense of their relationship with the earth. And, and I think that's essential whatever we do in whatever you know, medium. The, the actors have a relationship with the ground. From the ground they get their energy. And so we spent lots of time playing with our bodies, 
using our bodies, in a sense, to get in contact with the earth. Therefore, we get in contact with our voices. And so, in a sense, it's a way of just accessing an actor's body. Because very often, actors can have great access up here and lose a sense of what this is and the power of this. And um, that's something I strove to do. How, how does that shift then from when you shift from a, a production that's a, a play? And you've, you're also a, an experienced director. You, you've directed uh, plays. You directed musicals as well? I directed musicals and plays. And uh, how does that shift then when you move into musicals, say, for the current production of Nine, of which you're the choreographer? There's no shift at all, really. It's I come from exactly the same place if I choreograph dance as if I do movement in a play. It's about actors communicating character and story. Um, I have no dance background myself. I'm not a dancer. I never trained as a dancer. I fell into being a choreographer completely by accident. And so my, my route is as an actor. I started my life as an actor. And that's my understanding, is an actor's understanding. And an understanding of rhythm on stage. And not only rhythm in terms of choreographic rhythm, musical rhythm, in terms of pictorial rhythm as well. How the relationship between that actor over there and the rhythm between this actor down here actually communicates story. Well, that's fascinating because Joey McNeely, of course, <laughs> was a dancer <laughs> before he became a choreographer. And I think your first choreographic work on Broadway was Smokey Joe's Cafe, is correct. that correct? correct? And you're the current choreographer for The Boy From Oz. Yes. Now, that's, this is sort of interesting. I'd kind of like to engage a, a dialogue that. here. I, that's, I have a little bored of choreographer that's never I was never, a dancer. I mean, I, I find never, it fascinating. I never had tells us. I had <laughs> any aspiration at all to be a choreographer. I was an actor. I was very happy being an actor. But just the process of getting choreographic work from that perspective is... Um, quite different and I find that because you don't think like a dancer you think like an actor but you have to translate it into a physical movement mm, which is a little dances. opposite than from as a dancer yeah. I'm a dancer and I need to try to figure out the movement through an actor's perspective uh -huh. you know it's it's a, it's a flip side of working I have a question mm -hmm. when you say that the body gets its energy from the earth can you expand on that a little bit that actually or is that just it <laughs> or is, is that specific to Electra? I think that's specific to, to all actors. Okay. Yeah. To all actors that actually you, you, cut your, you can cut yourself off from your power source. And your power source is actually this thing here. This thing that gives us breath. If you, if you lower your sense of gravity, the whole, even just very technically, if your diaphragm drops, you have more breath, you have more power. The power of an actor comes from his breath. You know, to communicate, that is the power of his source. And ultimately, that ultimately comes from the earth. And okay, uh, um, I was working on a, on a show this summer with some people who were not um, trained as actors. Uh, and they thought, well, how do I do it? What am I, how am I acting? And we said, well, they said, first of all, you have no bad habits to break, so you're an advantage. <laughs> <laughs> but then, and it wasn't thinking of what uh, Jonathan was saying, but um, it, not to, I was talking about this, this piece of territory is your territory. No one's going to, once they realized they weren't standing on a stage, where were they standing? And they had to own this space, what it meant. They, they were Native Americans, and so they had a lot of reference towards mm -hmm. holding your ground, what ground meant, what it meant. And it was really a psychological aspect, and you could just see the difference. They just, if you took a photograph, you might not notice it. But suddenly being empowered that this is my ground and now I have a relationship to this, it was a completely different thing. And the other actors who were trained actors looked at them and, and just were stunned. They said, several of them said, I just learned more about acting because they just did it like that. They said, ah. Mm -hmm. And then you couldn't move them. Now, what and was this production that you were working it was, on? It was a, a, a musical uh, based on, on Lewis and Clark using oh, a lot of Native yes, Americans. Yes, yes. So, but, it was, but it was making movement meaningful so that it represents mm -hmm. something. You don't just cross the stage. Mm -hmm. Why do you do it? And I, th and I think later we'll go on to it. But in my, my awe of what uh, uh, Jonathan did with David is, is exactly that. It is just a continuation of a story, always, by different means. Mm -hmm. And um, 
and and uh, I've been one of very fortunate writer to have worked with Jonathan and David. Well, that's when the lines are crossed. You don't see the choreographer, you don't see the director. They just meld. It's all which mm -hmm. makes the best. one it's best way. conversation between mm -hmm. the director and the choreographer yeah. is sort of seen played out on the stage, mm -hmm. as it were. Mm -hmm. Susan, you were starting to say something. Uh, I was just going to say that that it's very interesting because um, I was actually trained as a dancer um, when I started out, and until I found out I had no talent at all, and, <laughs> oh. which was shocking to me. I have to say, I was crushed. But um, luckily, I had a role model in uh, Bennett Carroll at the time, but um, I, I always have felt, because I trained, I feel f with my body first and with my head second, always. My, my instincts are always movement mm -hmm. first, and um, that has never changed, even though I've, you know, long ago hung up the toe shoes. Um, and I also find it very interesting that there are people who were born with a kinesthetic sense of their body in space and where they're at, as Jonathan says, where their power source is. Mm -hmm. And there are people who have no idea about their body in space. They, they, they're like ping pong balls. You know, they go, they kind of bounce off things, scenery and other actors and things like that. And I, and I find that um, very often I will use a choreographer that I'm working with and, and say, take that person into a room and just kind of play just kind of get them used to, you know, feeling how, f just simple things, like right. how far they are from another person. You, you know the actor who comes right up to somebody like this <laughs> constantly, you know, <laughs> and talking in their face, you always want to go, no, 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 you don't need to be that close. They'll, you know, they'll what's feel the communication. What's through. finding their language, which I find yes. is each person, you got to change your language to communicate mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. From Absolutely. an actor, from a dancer, yeah. from someone, because, you know, a lot of times there are actors who, they see dance and they freeze up, and you have to figure out how can I get them to communicate, to move with their bodies and communicate like right. an acting. Sometimes you go from an acting perspective or from an emotional perspective, or like you say, you get in touch with the earth or something. They need, uh, and that's a challenge, you I know, I working with different I find it's always groups. the objective, though. I know there are people who are frightened of movement, yeah. just like there are some singers who are frightened of a certain high note, you know, and it's, I always say it's never about the note. It's not mm -hmm. the note. It's the note is there because it's an emotion. It's an you know, no, objective. No. It's an image. Think about that. Don't think about the note. And the same thing, I think, is true with movement. Don't think about the step. Right. Think about why you want to get there. And, you know, well, what, what I find, what I, I have a kind of a question for the playwrights, though, <laughs> because after just working with uh, Martin on The Boy from Oz, he was able to get inside of a character's emotional state and feeling and then present that. And I find... You know, I have to take, and same thing with directors, you have to take your cue off of what the playwright has written. You know, they write, all the lines are right there, and they say everything that the thing needs to say, and you need to translate that. How do you find those voices, and those unique voices of each character? Because I try to find their unique physicality within a character, but usually I'm already taking it off the page, so. Teresa Rebeck, that's actually a question that I had for you. I mean, how do these voices, how do these voices come to you? How does this process develop? Um, that's, not, I, that's what I found interesting about that, that notion of their, your power coming from the earth. Because I actually, I, I'm going to digress into some hippy-dippy chakra talk. Um, <laughs> that's okay. That, that this, uh, well, we can take it. There's this we can go. <laughs> 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 um, because, uh, as the, you know, uh, like somebody I met told me this, this uh, you know, and I'm always sort of curious, I'm, cu you know, you're right, you're curious about everything. And uh, this woman I know w told me that there was this thing to do where you plant your feet on the earth and, the, and, and do a breathing exercise so you could clear out your chakras. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, which I, I do sometimes and, and I feel better. You know, I, I, so uh, I feel it's like It's a that. yoga aesthetic. Yes, you know. it sure is. <laughs> and, um, but, uh, 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 to get back to the question, it, which also always feels to me like you have to center yourself deep inside the, 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 the body of the character so that the words can rise out of that. I mean, I know that this is sort of, you know, because sometimes I go, well, where do they come from? I don't know. Sometimes I'm lying there and I'll see someone in an orange sweater and think, oh, a person in an orange sweater, her name might be that, you know what I mean? That mm -hmm. It's sort of uh, the, the mystery of, uh, of where ideas come from. But, um, you know, I, I, this play I just worked on with, uh, that I wrote with a friend of mine, Alexandra Gersten Vasileros. Um, we, it, it's Omnium Gatherum. Omnium Gatherum. Okay. 
Yeah, um, <laughs> it's it's okay. got eight people in it, and they're involved in a very complicated argument. And the more we worked on the play, the more it became just utter. It was the same lesson you learned again and again, utterly clear that what the play was about was sort of the deep emotional centers of all those people, not the arguments at all. And that when the play is flying, it's because you're invested in what everybody is invested in. And that even, you know, there's one character who's a very highly educated and kind of um, provocateur Brit who uh, likes to really, who is very dazzling with his language and his ideas. But, you know, I finally went, he's showing off. That's, you know, like there's a deep need in him to show off. It's not about what he's saying. It's about the fact that he loves to show off, and that it was again just another lesson of you, 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 you have to ground yourself inside these people, and then let the language rise out of that. that but let me ask you because I'm space. always fascinated by creating from blank pages because we do that mm -hmm. as choreographers, you know, you know, and you do that as playwrights. Do you go in with a preconceived notion of where you're going to go? Or you just say, I got these people, I got these ideas, and let's just find out, and then the theme rises? Or do you go in with the theme first? Because I find that's always a challenge mm. for me as a choreographer, you know, and also like directing stuff or trying to create new materials. You know, are, you, are you saying that you feel as a choreographer you need to work from theme? Well, or it's, that you it's work uh, from story? Well, there's different processes. What I'm curious about is when you're going from scratch. I want to create an entity I'm looking for as an artist. And I'm speaking strictly from an artist's perspective. You know, we go in with creative energy and we walk into the space and we go, okay, let's just, I'm feeling this and this emerges and it becomes this sculpture. Or do you go and go, I want to do a theme about love I or a theme about that. power or something I like that? I never do that. <laughs> That's what I'm curious I, yeah. about. How do, I, how do I am always sort of fascinated by conflict or a situation with people I'm interested in. And then and I work it through until that sort of what I would call the deper subject emerges. It just, just emerges out it of it. Okay. Yeah, it, it emerges. Th does it become for you, Teresa, about the, the story, uh, the story you're telling me? I'm thinking through your plays, you know, Spike Heels, the story of this sort of class conflict and racial issues and, uh, uh, well, class and racial issues are, are really much, very much at play in that play. And in a number of your plays, there's a, a good deal of conflict between gender. You know, there's, there are mm. gender issues. Now, are there stories <coughs> that come to you, that, or the character, because you're saying that you, you think of this woman in an orange sweater. Mm. Do, or, or is it these characters that come to you and a story begins to emerge? How, is that how part of how the process um, you works? You know, so? I have to say, I suspect <coughs> it's, I, it feels very different for me for every project. I don't know what I think I'd be interested in here. I mean, uh, there was one, one, you know, I worked in Hollywood for a while on a sitcom, and it was one of the most psychotic <laughs> experiences of my life. <laughs> I mean, I was sort of like, I didn't know what I was getting into at all. And, uh, and I, I would go home, and I wouldn't be able to get out of bed in the morning, and I, I would sit in a room, like, terrified, and all these, and I kept thinking, I know there's a play here. This is just too strange a world for there not to be a play here. And then there was one day when I was driving down the street in this little old used car I had, and, uh, and I thought I was like Lear, King Lear, you know, and I, it's sort of like all of a sudden it all like, it was like all about power and, you know, that the executive producer was this sort of demented a monarch who was losing power and okay, he was name surrounded. names. No, 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 no. <laughs> you can pretty much insert numbers. Um, but and he was surrounded by the you know yes men, and then there was a you know a younger uh. guy cl climbing up. You know, and I thought, oh, this is this. And so for me, that clarified how to write that play, which I then did. That um, was the family. That was man. the family of man. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, mm. Spike Heel started because I was living in a very bad neighborhood and I heard these kids out on the street, and uh, this is on television so I can't use the language, but they were all like, they were just screaming obscenities at each other and there was a real music to it and a real rage and it was like a completely different language. And I thought, if you were going to do Pygmalion today, that's the language that, the, you know, that you would have to mm. change. And so that was, that was how that one started. But I, I, I do feel like, so I guess I feel like they start but it's funny because you've used a lot of yeah. classical references. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in, I have no back history background of theater or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It's like a dancer. I'll, I get a job and it moves on. And not to go to college and study all these classical, you know, pieces of plays. And it's funny how you, you, you well, go you know, back to themes of the... Because all right. the great themes have already been done. They're layered, you know, right. in Shakespeare and, and the Greek tragedies and everything. And I find... 
Do you well, th is I that mean, a reference? Maybe for me is that a great I'm reference? For, that's not a, it's not a conscious choice. I think what I look for in a story is something that's got stakes, that's got real, real, you know. Uh, I mean, you know, one thing when I teach, one, the, one of the plays I use as an example to my students is the piano lesson. Mm -hmm. Because you've got that piano in the middle of the play, and you've got mm -hmm. Boy Willie going, I'm going to sell that piano. And you've got Bernice going, you are not selling that piano. And Conflict they both theater. have beautiful reasons. Mm -hmm. And you can't take your eyes off it, you know. But, right. And so I'm always looking for a story that is going to fill the stage. I mean, I actually, I said to some students one time, you know, you're just going to ruin your life to be a playwright. So make it worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about making your life <laughs> in the theater, right? Yeah. I think really. you, you need to be personally engaged, I mean, in whatever it is. I can't, you've got to find something in the material, I find, that moves you or enrages you or sets you into some orbit. Otherwise, I think it's just work. It's, you know, mm -hmm. it's just washing dishes. And I think, um, not that you can't be creative about washing dishes, I suppose, but um, I think unless you make it personal on some level, and I think it mm -hmm. never lives and it never breathes. For me, sometimes it comes down to, um, I've had a conversation with more than one producer over a casting issue, and they'll go, but why this one and not that one? And I said, I cannot tell you, except this person yeah. interests me. This person perks my imagination. This person makes me want to look at them. That's it. I don't even think it's a question of talent. It's mm -hmm. a question of I have stakes in that person for whatever those ephemeral reasons are. And I think we all deal in a ephemeral issues. I mean, a play exists for the time it is being performed. Mm -hmm. It is never alive till it is being performed. You can read it and it can be a wonderful <laughs> experience, but until it's on stage and then that experience is gone. So I think until you yourself as a creator find something that moves you in some way, um, I don't think you can create. And that's what I, you know, I always look for. What is it at the center of the piece? I can't direct theme. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't direct message. So I can only direct emotion, a conflict. I can only direct I want, she wants, you know, that kind of thing. But what is it about it that moves me? And that's what I try to focus on. Because I figure somebody asked me to do it for a reason. They didn't ask someone else to do it. Right. So that what they're after is, you know, my feeling. And what I've, uh, uh, when I had done Sweeney Todd, I remember calling Steve Sondheim and saying, okay, tell me. And he said, you tell me. <laughs> you know, we had our chance. You tell right. me. What I'm after is what you see in it. What's different about the way you want to do it? That's what I'm interested in. And I thought, oh. But you need pieces that have that, which I find is always a challenge because we're not at the genesis of the material. We're usually at the... Well, the, sometimes the, I'm at the genesis yeah. of the material. The more often than not, lately, I find that, especially in musicals, I find that the director is very close to being at the genesis mm -hmm. of the material. I think they need to be, which I find is a lot of... Which is fault. very new, I think though. The, but this I think the choreographers in, in need to be there. Because I find a lot of times, I, I don't with the last with that one in... And, they're totally like, and they've, already, they've already formed where the dances are. And I always say, why is there a dance break here? Well, because it would be nice. Da why is this person dancing? I don't understand what's no, motivating I, them dancing. I completely agree with you. Time for you dance. Yeah. Yeah, and right. a lot of times yeah. they feel like, you know, choreography is just for the dance and the entertainment. It was like, well, no, I can be a storyteller, too. I can be, as you say, movement. You know, there's a, there's a way people move within well, the now, background. Now, tell, tell us a little bit about, story, in tell. the case of The Boy from Oz. Uh, here you're dealing with a, a subject whom many of us remember from his performance work. Mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's very much a part of our memories. How did, how did you uh, evolve your choreography in that? Did you, did you go back to look at uh, Peter Allen's earlier work? Yeah, we've well, done a lot of research for that, yeah. T tell us a little bit about that well, and how that Within that, that show, I mean, the you nature of the choreography was a little different because each number that had choreography was a performance number. Those are simple. You're on stage, I'm here to entertain, it's a performance. So we can, you know, you can, um, it's usually high energy, it's usually keeping the ball up in the air, picture steps, razzmatazzle, you know, all that stuff. And everything else was a book scene between two characters. So you mean, so th there's a very clear definition of where that place is. What I find I I'm more interested in, because I'm always trying to push my boundaries a little bit, is, you know, from a playwright's perspective and a character's perspective and as a director, to try to feel like how can mm -hmm. dance and movement become as integral 
to the storyline as lyrics, mm -hmm. as the as the notes to the music. And I've been working be. on West Side Story a it great deal be. over in Europe, mm -hmm. and I love it. I just I just adore that musical because it's to me it's perfection. Arthur well, Cogan, oh, all those all those elements. Is, is, well, those is movements, a, all those elements create. Very, the same storyline, mm -hmm. you know, everything's about character, the music, the lyrics, the dance movement, which I feel like, you know, in theater, we need to do more of that or be open to that, you know, to that Arthur Copet, who's sitting to my left here, I want to right. bring him into the <laughs> yes, conversation, course, sorry. and that is, uh, you, you have been, you're one of the few people, I think, few playwrights who actually made a living mm -hmm. on the Broadway stage for many years, a, a sort well, of living, anyway? So, so it had no it killing. helped. Mm -hmm. But no killing, right? <laughs> Uh, Temporary killings. <laughs> 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 killings that come and go, as it were. Killings and college come and tuition go. comes along and then mm -hmm. who knows oh, what yes. Oh, yes. yes. So how does that, how that process of, you, you started out as a playwright, and then you became a book writer for musicals, or were you always a book? How does that process work? How do those two ways of working speak to one another? That one thinks of a playwright um, toiling away in a room by him or herself. Right, writing the book of a musical is no work at all. I mean, it's toil. It's a different kind of toil. What kind of toil? How does that? How do those two speak to one another? Well, they're very different. I mean, b writing a play is very different from writing a, 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 a musical. Uh, for one, is the collaboration, and it's not your piece that's being expressed. It's a collective piece. Uh, I've always I've loved musicals. I've loved plays. They do different things. There's, cer there's certain material that there's some material that could be a play and it could be a musical, but you have to ask yourself, well, why is this a musical and what's its, mm -hmm. what is it going to express that you couldn't express without music? Um, and then uh, you, you can study it, but you've seen it. I think you have to have an instinctive sense of how a musical's story unfolds as opposed to a play's story. There are just certain aspects. They're not rules, but there's a way the major elements are going to be sung or they're in music or else why is it a musical? Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is not because the audience is there to be entertained, but because the emotion is so great that it can't be expressed only in words. If you can express it only in words, then it undercuts the need to get to something that is secret and coded. Uh, and the very artifice of, of the musical uh, enables it in some ways to be realer because all, all theater is artifice. It's all a con game. And, and so you're pretending, and when you have two people speaking and uh, singing to each other, uh, you have to make the audience believe that this is actually happening in some strange place. So that once you do that, once you have earned the right to play this game, you set up certain rules, and these are never conscious. They're just, they're happening, and the audience trusts you. And, and because of what you can do with lights, are part of it, the changing of a mood, of a tone, a changing of a light. One chord can change the whole mood. A movement somewhere, the shifting of the eye is all part of, of storytelling. So if you're, I mean, I think everyone does it differently, but the kinds of musicals that I am excited about writing, and I'm excited about seeing lots of shows that I, I wouldn't write, I couldn't write them well, I, I wouldn't bring something to it, but where, um, it's it's doing it, it's tapping into a different part of your your energy than than the writing of a play, and it means that you are feeding into the collaborative skills of a director, choreographer. They're really meshed, even costumes, the set, the way it looks. You don't see it specifically, but everything is creating the story. And it's if you stop to think, it's scary because everything has to work if it's on that level. If, if the characters are layered, if there, there, there are themes and counter themes, and all of that's happening, which you, you don't put in consciously. I mean, thinking, I, I, I think the worst thing is to think. So therefore, you have to think about not thinking. I mean, you <laughs> yeah. have to think yeah. in order to put yourself in the state of mind in mm -hmm. which instincts take over. But if you just let your instincts go, the instincts might be, I want to get out of here. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it, so so this, that collaboration in the beginning with your sensibility and your consciousness and your intellect and that which has nothing to do with it but is simply telling yourself a story has to have a very fine line 
because you can't edit yourself, and yet you are editing yourself, mm -hmm. and, you're, and you're watching what's good and what's not good, but yet it's not on the basis of what do the audience say. You're saying, is this honest or not? But then how do you define honest? It's a constant dialogue with yourself. Mm -hmm. And in the musical, I mean, for me, the, the high point absolutely has, has been this production of Nine, because I mean, it never occurred to me that a piece of work that I was involved with could be performed, produced on, on such a level where, where there's a thrill where you're involved with, you didn't do it yourself, it's everybody came together mm -hmm. and everybody saw the same target. And that's always said, you all have to be doing the same show. But in this case, there was such a microscopic um, zoning in on what it was about that, uh, for me, uh, you know, what Jonathan talks about um, was startling because it is, is the meshing of everything together. And I know for Maury and for myself, uh, I should say Maury, Maury Heston, Heston, the composer and lyricist, um, when you write a play, uh, there's dialogue, but I've always felt, and I try to tell players that I'm teaching, the dialogue is the least of it, the absolute least of it. Too much dependence upon talk gets you nowhere. Uh, you don't even need may, the talk. May I ask you, it's like, what about the dialogue between the creators? How often do you guys continue to communicate and try to well, mesh things out? Well, you out? communicate in different ways. Um, I've, I have worked with directors uh, who could explain the play perfectly, and they got on the stage and they didn't know what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Same thing with actors. You can't trust what you're saying. Um, you, you, you get a feeling, and you see what somebody does and how they're working with an actor. And, I mean, and like before that, though, like before we get to the rehearsal point, you know. You'd be surprised how little conversation yeah. goes on. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you can't articulate this. I can't tell you. I know Edward Albee mm -hmm. saying, uh, you know, he, he's afraid that you know, if somebody came in too soon in the process, they'd ask him what he meant. Yeah. <laughs> Don't know what you mean. I hate it's to do this because this is when we're really getting lively here, but we need to take a short break. Okay. And Isabel Stevenson is going to tell us about the great works of the American Theater Wing. Before we get back to the American Theatre Wing's Working the Theatre Seminar on Playwright, Director, Choreographer, I would like to remind you that these seminars are only one of the many year-round programs that the Wing undertakes. You are probably familiar with the American Theatre Wing's Tony Award, given for achievement of excellence in the craft of Broadway Theatre. We also have an important grants program providing aid to off and off-off Broadway theatres. We have expanded our scholarships to promising students to pursue studies in the theater arts. And we offer a comprehensive guide to careers in the theater for those seriously interested in entering the profession. As a long-established charity dating back from World War I and World War II and our famous stage door canteens, all of our programs are designed to reward and promote excellence in the theater. We just love to introduce young people and their families to theater and the magic it unfolds. We take pride in the work we do, remain grateful to our members and everyone else whose contributions help make possible the dynamic programs of the American Theater Wing. Our work is so important to the theater and the community, and we are proud to be a part of this exciting industry. And so now, let's return to our panel on playwright, director, choreographer, and our moderator, Jeffrey Eric Jenkins. Jeffrey. Thank you, Isabel. Well, we're joined as we return by Moises Kaufman, the talented director of I Am My Own Wife, which played uh, successfully at the Playwrights Horizons Theater and is on its way to Broadway. And uh, in, in your, as we went away to our break, we were talking about the collaborative process. We were talking about how the collaborative process evolves in the musical theater. And um, I'm, I'm wondering, I know, most, Moises, that you are uh, well known for your work in collaboration. Your plays, um, Gross Indecency, The Three Trials of Oscar Wilde, um, and of course, The Laramie Project, which was the story of uh, the death of Matthew Shepard and how it affected 
an entire community, and, and, and I think probably how it affected an entire nation. How do you work in these kinds of collaborations? How do you build a community when you're working with actors and that sort of thing? We'd like to bring you into this conversation with us. Well, <coughs> I think it's rather different. The, the model by which we, Tectonic Theater Project, as a company, creates work is very different, for example, than when I direct I Am My Own Wife. I Am My Own Wife is not a production of Tectonic Theater Project. Uh, it's a production that I was brought in to direct um, with my dear friend Doug Wright. Um, so that is a very different model than the models we use within the theater company. Uh, in the theater company, we're very interested in thinking about how the work gets made. I think that the most common model in American theater is that a writer goes into a room, writes a play, and then she or he comes out of that room, gives the play to the director, the director goes into another room. Uh, many times the writer and director is excluded from that second room. Uh, and four weeks later you have a production. Um, I'm exaggerating to make a point. And, but that's, that's kind of a model that we know very well. And to me that, that model is very profitable sometimes and very uh, fruitful sometimes. But it, it, it is problematic that it is one of the only models that we're working with. Um, so I think that one of the things that we question at the theater company is what are the ways in which theater can be made? Uh, for Gross Indecency, we got into a room with all of the sources about the trials of Oscar Wilde, and out of that emerged this play. Uh, for the Laramie Project, we as a theater company went to Laramie, interviewed the people of the town of Laramie for a year, came back, and wrote the play as a company that ended up being the Laramie Project. So in, in our work, we're very interested in questions about collaboration. Um, I think that we're very invested in having the director direct, and the actor act, and the writer write, and the designers design. And these are all very, very punctual jobs. Um, and I think that the, that separation in the jobs is very necessary to have the, the form I described before work. You know, a writer writes a play, and then they come into a room. Everybody knows exactly what their, what their specialization is, and they do just that. Um, I think, for example, in the Laramie Project, the actors became interviewers. And then when they were looking through the material, they became transcribers. And then when they were choosing the material they wanted to show the rest of the company, they became editors. And then when they presented the material in front of the company, they became actor-directors. So there's a way in which I am interested in kind of a a renaissance idea of a theater person, uh, a theater artist. And is there something to be gained by having each one of the collaborators know a lot about the fields that everybody else is involved in? I mean, I think that creates for a very rich environment. Uh, and there's a lot of fights. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but, it's, but it's a very nurturing, exciting. Yeah. Um, and that was very different from working in I Am My Own Wife. Uh, in I Am My Own Wife, Douglas brought me in early enough on in the process that we were developing it together in a way. Um, and because it was only one actor, that there was a connection that was made from early on that, that really persisted. But I don't know. I like theater and the, people. These are, and these pieces all have in common, it seems to me, a kind of uh, what Emily Mann has called the theater of testimony that are based on sources and then sort of fleshing that source out and giving it a, a kind of a humanity, bringing it to life, giving it breath, that sort of thing. Yes, I think there's an element to that. I think that the difference between these pieces and, and the work of Emily is that, you know, this is all com always comes as a shock, but I think that the documentary aspect of it is almost a side aspect of it. The important thing for me is to, s to think about forms, about theatrical forms, and why is it that we're still stuck in realism and naturalism which are 20th, 19th century forms. Where are the new forms of writing? Of, you know, and I think that that's more the focus. So it's not so much <coughs> a theater of testimony, but a kind of formalistic question. Uh -huh. May I ask you, do you find that people are open to the new forms of theater? Because I find there's a certain resistance. Everyone, they're so comfortable in what worked in the past, and they just want to do that. And I, have, I find it's difficult as a new generation as a theater creative to try to find the new voices because everyone wants to keep going in the past wave. Well, my, my answer to that is very uh, 
is very subjective because both Gross and Decency and Laramie Project have been very well received. Mm -hmm. So in my experience, I think there is a, a great hunger for new forms. People, I think that the, 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 the success or the resonance of the place has been, yes, because of the subject matter, but also because people are saying, oh, you know, I never knew the theater could do this or could yeah. behave that way or I could be, you know... What, the question is, what is the thing that can happen in the theater that doesn't happen in film and television? Okay, except well, I have to say something right now. <laughs> I actually have to defend uh, realism and naturalism in the theater because I think that television and film does it badly. I mean, I think one of the reasons that people respond to it is because it's so thinned out in, in film and, and television and so corrupted by, by you know, layers of bureaucrats who just want to bleed, bleed all sort of sense and meaning and and uh, examination of psychology. I mean, there are many things that realism does beautifully that can only be done beautifully on the stage. So I think that uh, I think that uh, there's that sort of uh, n necessary embrace of form and content. That there are certain stories that must be told mm -hmm. in that mode. You know, that that breaking it open uh, or 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 just doing experiments on on certain stories for no good reason will will just end up with bad theater, which also sometimes happens. I think I think that you know it's not that I'm okay. Somebody said the other me, right. oh, so you think that there shouldn't be no more realistic or naturalistic place, and that's no, not what I mean at all. Think that, though. Yes, but right. I don't. Right. I think that that Yay. you know it's a form that does. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's a form that does certain things that can be done very very beautifully. But I worry that right now, in our current stages, 90% of the work one sees is realism or naturalism. Mm -hmm. I think that it is, you know, overwhelmingly realism and naturalism. And as I say, I don't, I don't think that, I mean, I think there's room for that, but where is the questioning of, of you know? Arthur? No, I, I was just going to say, I, I actually agree, and I find it even to be that way in musical theater. I think that uh, they've gotten so literal. Then and uh, it's it for me it drives me crazy because I think the very nature of a musical is non-literal, exactly. and to then put it in a literal context, I think if you have these two things fighting against each other, and so often they do not work. Um, I think you can find um, much more expression expressionistic ways of presenting that story. Um, I think, as author had said earlier, once people start singing, you're not in a real or a natural well, world mm. anyway. Yeah. Or they're going to dance to communicate. You're not in a real and natural world. <laughs> so how can you expand the milieu that you've put these characters in s and still get honest emotion across? And I felt your production <laughs> of Sweeney Todd did that so beautifully. I really, I was, I was so blown away by that because it was that perfect moment where it was el the whole thing was elevated to a place where it really worked. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But those, those words, realism and naturalism, are very confusing words anyway. Yes. In that, yes. you know, we're all yeah. sat here, this, we've got an audience sat here, mm -hmm. being very real and very natural. <laughs> <laughs> would we want to sit and watch them all evening as they kind of just sit there? No, we wouldn't. <laughs> right. You know. Right. What, 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 would, what we, what we <laughs> do. <laughs> I would watch it. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, after a while, we'd actually get very interested in that because it would become heightened. By very mm -hmm. very natural fact that we we as an audience are now observing you, right. it becomes heightened. Therefore, it doesn't become real again. We so become as soon as, become, as soon as you know you have a spectator, you become. Right. And let's face it, we all perform uh, all the time. We're mm -hmm. performing now. We perform at home in a certain way. It's a different kind of mask well, that we well, wear. We're, we're all natural storytellers. Mm -hmm. You know, as soon as you start, you start telling someone a, an event that happened. How often are you telling it? Are you reporting it? Mm -hmm. Aren't you? instinctively adding things, embellishing, coloring, just by what you choose to leave out, what you choose to put in, what you, how you, your emotion colors that event. I mean, I think that, I think you're absolutely right. I think there is no true naturalism, no true realism that exists once something is on stage. I think it's all heightened. And it's yeah. all specifically. But do you I, like, no, well, I mean, yeah. I just I go, oh come on, Chekhov was a genius. So beautiful what he did. You but, know, you can't. Well, one of the problems is, is something that you, you've mentioned. Well, recently. Like, sorry. It, it, what has to do with it has to do with this notion of of television and yeah. film, which have sort of deracinated. Mm -hmm. The Distorted. theatrical expression. Yeah. And, well, may I also say that's so what the audiences now have been trained. They're not trained okay. to think anymore. Right. They like, they can only digest <laughs> the simplest forms. You know, and when you can push the envelope a little bit, they go, oh wow. You know, but it's like the majority of the audiences. 
don't want that. They're not responding. But this don't question has been true, asked. That's true, Joey. I think. Th- Sorry. <laughs> no, I was just saying, this, this question has been asked for, yeah. for, forever. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, if you go back to Chekhov, you, you have Konstantin mm-hmm. in the seagull saying, yes. we need new forms. Yes. Right. Something yes. else is going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's terrible. You know, here's new forms that are useless and terrible, but it Ar- needs to be saying that's what we need. That's Arthur, the argument. trying to get in here for a second. I, I and, 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 and it's been building up. So <laughs> <laughs> I think I agree and disagree with everything here. <laughs> um, first, I don't think there's any realistic theater in the sense that I don't, I don't agree that there's realism and naturalism. It was a f- it's, it's, it's a, like all catchphrases, it leads you astray. Mm-hmm. All good acting is real. And I think that it is real because, and it was just in, in Moscow, they, their actors are extraordinary, and they're able to do things that we can't do here because they work for four months, five months, six months on a play mm-hmm. with directors who are used to that. And one of the things that Moises has is he has a company and he works with. And, and, and our theater is set up, l- and very much because of financial problems that are put on by u- actors' unions, and I understand that, but it really inhibits the development of, yeah. of not new forms for new forms. What I love about all the productions of yours that I've seen, and they're, they're fantastic, uh, is it's not new forms. It is ways of telling a story. There's com- there is no self-indulgence. It is all focused. It is all real. And the audience connects, and an audience understands it immediately. There's no resistance because they see what it's about. But you can't do that in three weeks rehearsal, four weeks, five weeks, with a completely new cast. They know the vocabulary. You know who they are. They work in a shorthand. Most plays that are rehearsed here in the first five weeks or the first three weeks are just getting to know who the cast is. Mm -hmm. They don't begin rehearsal until the third or fourth week, and then it's time for tech. You can't do anything. Mm. And the commercial money comes in because it's so expensive to produce a play, the producer wants to know what they're going to get. When you start with a company that has built up rapport and a vocabulary and the kind of collaboration that should exist in great theater, nothing new. It is the es- essence of theater. Let's, we need to do something, and they all believe in this, and they're going to find what the show is supposed to be. And there's no deadline saying you've got to do it in two weeks. They'll do something, and then they'll do something, and they develop it until it takes its right form. There's no resistance from an audience. They haven't seen it, and they can't see it because the way the theater is set up financially, it can't be done. You can't get the best actors out of actors' equity to work in that form because the union will stop them. And they'll say you're taking advantage of the actors, which is nonsense. Not only are you not taking advantage of those actors, you're allowing those actors to flourish and grow and be seen. And it's, and it's terrible. It has to be admitted. It isn't that actors should be taken advantage of, but actors who are great actors, who are members of equity, would love to be able to do something that stretches them and pushes them, and then they can go and make their money. They are being seen, as well as writers and directors. So that's one of the great problems, is that the union situation mm-hmm. is set up against that. Any Theater, sort of any, you put yeah. up a, a play that's supposedly in a, in, a, in a real room, that's phony. It's not in a real room. We're pretending to be real. The audience <laughs> knows they're not real. Mm-hmm. This is a convention, an artifice. It's all pretending. And when it's great, we believe the pretending like a little kid, and you say, hey, I'm I'm dying. You know he's not dying. That's not real. In a real play, it was realism. He'd die. You know, nobody wants that. So it's all a convention that is used the audience understands. But it's an easier convention. When you start to break those conventions, you don't have a ready template. So you have to find the new template. And you don't know if you'll get it the next day, because you're working to find what is real and what is the real emotion that expresses the emotion that's what in there. What is honest? Maybe it's better than real, even, isn't it? What is true? Yes. What I is would, true? I and and, and so you, you, you can't define it with words, so it takes time. And so we would love to all be working there, I think, ideally. But even in a school, you can't teach this. You have to go, and you have dedicated and very gifted mm-hmm. people who have a vision, and they do it. And then maybe all the groups that create theater will realize that for the theater to flourish, it needs to make this available to other artists who want to do something that breaks the form, not for the sake of breaking the form, but to get at something that is, mm-hmm. that is fresh and startling and true to the human experience. Well, it's certainly, it's, <laughs> it's certainly, uh, <laughs> it, it is certainly true, though, and it, I certainly understand Moises's um, frustration with the resistance that there is, there does, there is a certain amount of resistance. I don't think it comes 
from the audience necessarily, mm -hmm. but I think it is coming from somewhere, and I think maybe it's coming from the folks who rely on um, profits from shows to be able to invest in other shows. And I don't want to vilify producers. I'm not in that business of vilifying producers, but those pressures, those commercial pressures, often ha carry a lot of weight. And I was thinking, actually, uh, when Moises was talking about your production of Sweeney Todd, and I'm thinking also of the Sound of Music revival that you did, I'm wondering, when you're working, Susan, on those, um, those kinds of projects, on a revival, are there expectations from the producers to replicate something that's come before, or, you know, could you... These were two very different situations. Okay. Um, Sweeney Todd started at the York Theatre, where, um, you know, it was a, um, it, it was a very much the situation that um, we were talking about, where you could really work for longer periods of time, where people could collaborate with each other. It was very low-keyed. There was no budget. Um, there was no uh, problem with expectation. There had already been a wonderful production of Sweeney Todd not ten years earlier. That So the show was a proven entity. It was a masterpiece. Um, why I was doing it, I was out of my mind, obviously. <laughs> um, but, you know, I thought, when else am I going to get a chance to do the show? So I'll do it on a basketball court, which is what we had at the York Theater. And, yes. you know, sometimes <laughs> when you have hilarious. nothing... It really, you it, uh, it, I, I tell you, adversity really does, does help sometimes. And, um, and the shape of the basketball court and the, the closeness w uh, within oh. this environment so that we had to be sort of on top of each other in many ways caused a heat that uh, I think I was able to then translate uh, to the show. And um, also it, it, it created a kind of strange humor that it became very darkly, very funny in, mm. in, a, in a way that it had, I don't know if that was the original intent, I mean, Steve said it was, but, you know, it, 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 it evolved in a way that's frightened me, actually, because I sort of lost control. It took over, mm. in a way. I, I don't mean it lost directorial I'm control, sure. but a sure. vision control. Sure. It took over, and I said, okay, that's great. Let it go. Mm. Let me see how far this goes. I'm at the New York Theater. I'm at the Church of the Heavenly Rest. Who cares, you know? Right. There were no stakes. <laughs> there was no money in it. It didn't matter, you know, until the night that Steve came back from Oxford and said, okay, where do you want me to sit? And I went, oh, my God. The creator is here. <laughs> He's going to kill me, you know. And I think, no, okay, well, he doesn't like it. It doesn't have to do anything. It doesn't go anywhere. And it's fine. And, uh, you know, he sat down next to me, took 150,000 notes, and I thought, my life is over. <laughs> um, and it, it, but the end of what she said, this is swell. This is really swell. And, of course, you know, to, for me, to please the writer is, <laughs> is everything. Um, I think if you can in some way make that vision alive. I think you, that's what you're here for. But um, then by, it, so it started that way and then it moved to Broadway because it got well so reviewed. and did it Exactly. So it went up in stages. Exactly. So it stages. It, 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 took, it took on. And then, of course, when it was moving, I became very, um, uh, very careful that it moved into an environment that would allow it to sustain what we had discovered by doing it on a basketball court. So basically, we found a little bigger basketball court, you know, uptown uh, kind of thing. But there were commercial producers who wanted to move it into a proscenium house. And I said, mm. I, 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 it, it, no, you know. Yeah. So that wasn't going to work. Sound of Music started out as a purely um, commercial venture in that um, I was called, I was asked if I wanted to do a revival of Sound of Music. And the first question out of my mouth was, what do you mean by a revival of the sound of music? <laughs> I said, do you mean the sound of music as it's always been done, or do you mean take a new look at the sound of music? Um, and of course, they said, oh, no, 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 of course. A new look at sound of music. They said, you know, do with it what you do with Sweeney Todd. I went, <laughs> 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 Completely <laughs> night and day. <laughs> you think? Yeah. I don't know. Just, um, Put it on a basketball court and no, let it run away with this. Right, thing. but uh, also, I was dealing with Sweeney Todd. I was dealing with a live author. And that was a different collaborative situation. Here, I was dealing with relatives of dead people mm -hmm. who, yeah. you know, in some aspects were wonderful and some aspects were very protective. So you were allowed to do only so much and then you couldn't do other things. And, and now even what I did 
I'm allowed to do, but no one else is allowed to do. So it's, you, it's very difficult when you're dealing with a very established mm -hmm. piece like that, and the authors are not alive. I'm always, I always feel that if the authors were alive, like with Fiddler on the Roof, because Jerome Robbins is gone, I think it's more difficult to do it. Well, Joe Stein's because with people stuff. are mm. trying to hold and on. And Jay Balkan show. And right. and yeah. Jay, yeah, no, the, but but it's so much Robin's production that to get a whole new breath on that, I think is is going to be a challenge. And, and that actually takes me right into the yes. next thing, Jonathan. Is that uh, how is that operating in in bringing this revival uh, along of Fiddler on the Roof? It will be a completely new production. Um, and this is a production that is kind of at the heart of New York in lots of senses. Yes, it has a great mm -hmm. attachment to the people of New York. And there's this kind of idea, we are going to do a new production. Does that mean we're going to pull um, Fiddler on the Roof into a new territory? No, we're going to do Fiddler on the Roof. Right. We're going to tell that story. Um, and we have three living writers, you know whose combined age is about 245, <laughs> <laughs> but they're live kicking and very, very excited. Right. And then there is the legacy of the man, the genius, who directed the original production and choreographed the original production. Um, there is an estate who is there to protect what he did, and I have the responsibility of recreating the dance choreography for that, this new production. Um, it is completely different. In, es in the space that we've created this production is very different from the space that was created in 1964 um, because our audience is very different. The theatre we, yeah. we, we work in now is very different. Um, but my responsibility is to tell that story. And I also then the responsibility of recreating someone else's choreographic work. There is no responsibility to actually take on the whole production we are allowed and given rain to actually re-look at the piece. The three writers are very happy to re-examine the piece and work collaboratively with us in rehearsal, as it was done originally. Um, I just have the responsibility of recreating the dance, which is very, very exciting, because it's to take someone else's work, and in essence it will be fed through me. Mm -hmm. It can only be channeled through how I hand that work over. But I think it's more than just someone else's work, it's Jerry's work. Exactly. Which I think is just, yeah. to process that is just, it was the best. Yeah. Jerry was the best With out the there. greatest, mm -hmm. greatest respect. And, yeah. you have and to it's great mm -hmm. to be able to have that privilege. But, but also you have to, in essence, let go of the legend as well, in order mm -hmm. that you can actually see the work in its purest sense. Otherwise you, you, you work from a place that actually it's at distance from you. Mm -hmm. And my responsibility to hand it over to dancers or to fellow actors is that I cannot have distance on it. It has to come through me. I have to channel, in essence, that man mm -hmm. and where he was coming from. And that's going to be a challenge because my, uh, my job is to take on that responsibility of recreating but not in a, in a way that it's a museum piece, not in the way that it's right. just planting something that was done that time. And he was a theatre artist, like I am, like we all are, who f observed the moment he was in. And I have to pay respect to him and observe the moment that I'm in, in the rehearsal room with those actors. I, I have to actually take on that moment and make that moment alive and that's what we all do yeah. is well, it's very character based yeah. which if you can just get into the character it all makes mm -hmm. sense yeah well you know we've talked a little bit about the different ways of making a life in the theater people who move from dance to choreography and acting to choreography and directing I i'm sort of interested to know um, uh, particularly in the cases of moises and teresa uh, I know that moises you you've uh, adapted uh, you adapted you in the tectonic theater project adapted um, Laramie Project into a film, and I'm wondering how that process, you know, changes. How, how does the process change when you're moving from the theater into a film project? Well, I think that the main thing is that, <coughs> as, as it's a different medium, if we are really saying, okay, what is the thing that theater can do that only theater can do, and then somebody comes along and says, great, now make it into a movie. Mm -hmm. Then the question becomes, what is the thing that film can do that only film can mm -hmm. do? And what is the thing that the medium can contribute to the telling of the story? 
Um, and it's interesting because I've heard many times to this panel say, well, going at form for form's sake is a mistake. And I find that so interesting because nobody would say, well, going at content for content's sake is a mistake. We think of form as something very divorced from and separate from the story. And I, th I think that that's not two separate things. You know, like I think it was Samuel Beckett who said form is content. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there is a way in which w the only thing that I consider a terrible mistake is to not pay attention to form. I think that as, as long as you're aware of both things happening at the same time. And, you know, in Tectonic we have this exercise in which we talk about what the subject matter is or what the story is, and then we take a break and we talk about what are the forms that best express or deal with this, you know, so we keep both notions up in the room. And so that was something that we really did also when we made it into a film. What is it that the camera can tell us about Laramie? What is it that, the, how can the camera tell us the story of that town in the year after Matthew's murder? How, how does that, the camera, um, tell stories? Mm -hmm. I Because think, think form is, is all that we deal with. That, that's all that mm -hmm. we deal with. Mm -hmm. Because in essence, the only responsibility we have is, is the, the two poles, that are the energy that occurs between two poles is the unknown, is the, the thing we cannot control. And that's the life of it. So we can actually only control the form of it because actually life comes from a place that actually no one understands. And we can talk about concepts and where we can forever. Actually, what is alive on stage is a, is a mystery, mm -hmm. I feel, continually. You go and you, you see theatre and you know when theatre is alive and you know when theatre isn't alive. And the difference is a mystery. And we, we're ritual based. And you know in five minutes. You know instantly. <laughs> yeah. You know them, you know instantly. Can I, can I get back on the form issue? Because yes, I was the one who said it, and I still, and I still believe it. Um, being in Russia, because the directors have so much time, and the theater is director driven, and the writers basically don't write plays uh, on their own, they wait for a director to hire them to write a play. Hmm. Um, what happens, that I saw, were very, very many very gifted playwrights, but um, there, there was no overall, it seemed to me, no overall narrative arc to the piece, and that um, the directors, very often the pieces had dazzling theatrical moments, amazing form, but what I then discovered after was that I was sensing from watching the play without understanding was that there was no story going from beginning to end. And, that, and the writer's great frustration is that they have no control whatsoever over this. And, and we was talking about American theater as contrasted with, with the Russian theater. Um, and there, the, the form was being used as simply a, a, an expression of a moment, but it didn't come together. Absolutely, it is the form and the content are linked together. But I know very often you get younger writers, and I teach sometimes, that they're starting out and saying, well, I think this is a comedy, and I think that, and they're trying to name it. And I said, mm -hmm. do not name it. Don't worry. The form will reveal itself. It's when you start to think, well, what is it? And you name it. And you say, well, it's going to be realistic. We're going to have a dance that's going to do this. And mm -hmm. it's dead. The two are completely wedded. But if you think first, you know, I can think about form, and I'm really thinking of the form is coming in the proper direction. The two are linked. But when form for its own sake, then you get Constantine. We need new forms. We need new ways to express mm -hmm. something that is a story. So my r reply, which is the same as yours, is it's all about story. Mm -hmm. And story is told through a form. So you have to know the story, and then you allow the story to let to guide you to what the form of it is supposed mm -hmm. to be. But it's only when, and that was this fascinating thing in, 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 in Russian theater, where this amazing technique, but it, it, the, the directors didn't understand that, there was, that these images must all match together and that there is a once upon a time mm -hmm. that happens in, in theater, in dance. Um, so I think we're, it's, the same, it's the same thing. You know, I'm also interested in, in, our ter in terms of what we're thinking about process. It's about the process also of becoming an artist. You know, those of us who teach yeah. always <laughs> tell our students, and there are a fair number of students here, and there are students hopefully watching us at home, and we want to sort of address that issue. You know, how does one become an artist? It, it's a process. For me, becoming an artist is becoming a human being, and we're always becoming a human being, and that's a great thing to say. But I'm sort of interested in how folks 
got started? What kinds of, of training did, did you get? What do you recommend? When Getting a benefactor. Thinking, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> sure. A benefactor is a great thing to have. Um, patrons, the loss of patrons is a real problem. The Medici, where yeah, are they? Yeah. Where are they? We need modern <laughs> there are modern Medici <laughs> today. You know, that, it's true. That, that is, I think of the Steinberg Charitable Trust, and they're, they're great right. Medicis of, uh, of playwriting, in fact, in, in this country. But I, I'm wondering if, if some could just, uh, like, and Teresa, you've made a life in the theater by making a life in television. I mean, you're a very well-respected writer of, uh, of the Law and Order dramas, of Yes, Brooklyn but you Blue, know, and, and I have to say, Man I think that this is Blue. like perversely the opposite of having a patron, because yeah. I, I, <laughs> over time I became so, I mean, because the really the difficulty, I, I, I started working in television because I needed to support my family. Um, and I felt grateful that I could do so using the, my talent. And also, beca because you're, if, you're, if you're not a playwright who like hits, um, y you spend a lot of time not working or just doing a reading here, that, you know, and it was just, uh, you know, that hunger to work, y you, y you can't underestimate it. And so uh, when I began doing it, it uh, and I worked on some shows that where I was really proud and challenged, NYPD Blue in, in the early seasons was a great place to work. But um, the more I did it, <laughs> the more intolerable it became um, because there's so much interference in the organic process. There's so many, there's, you know, story, story needs. You know, sit around a room with like 15 people deciding what's going to happen next. You go, I want to go home. <laughs> um, um, and then the network's calling, the I this remember. calling, the that calling. I mean, and there was one show that I finally worked on where I felt like I, my brain was being put through a sieve. Mm. And, um, and I just felt like that, that pressure, you know, w it, that pressure sort of pushed me into a direction where, where that became more and more intolerable. And, and sort of the, the artist erupts out of that, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what sort of, what, what kind of, of training uh, have, uh, Moises, uh, now I know you uh, trained at NYU, did you work in this kind of uh, company system there? Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what I want folks to share is what we can tell our students, the people watching us today, how can they prepare for a life as an artist, as a theater artist? How can they make a life in the theater? Well, I think the, the, the best way to prepare is to be in the theater, to, you know, I, I, the first thing I did, there was a theater, uh, I studied in Venezuela first, and there was a theater company uh, at the university where I was studying there, and I loved their work, so I came in one day and I said, I have some time off, and for like five months, I, I, I was a, f a follow spot operator, uh, and in the, in the particular show that was running at the time, the spot was only lit two and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, and I have to say it was such a thrill, and I think that, that that you know, and then I joined that theater company, and I was with them for like five years as an actor, and then I realized that I really wanted to write and direct, so I came to NYU to the experimental theater wing, and uh, and the rest kind of like th there you really were able to find formally how to construct the kind of environment in which you wanted to work. Teresa, did you? Oh, you know, I actually had one thing that I did uh, that I did tell my students for a while, and I think it's very true. Um, that you have to prepare yourself for a, a chaotic life. That <laughs> you know that you have to start to understand that your life will not look like anyone, any, anyone, anyone else's, else. <laughs> <laughs> and That's that right. and uh, that yeah. you have to just learn to tolerate that and not put expectations on yourself mm -hmm. that mirror like social expectations. Because mm -hmm. right. our whole work yeah. is the negotiation between the pragmatic and the chaotic. You know, because mm -hmm. that that <laughs> is all mm -hmm. the time. I mean, I also think the biggest word is sacrifice. To be an artist, you must sacrifice. And what do you mean by that? We always we, we always think of the artist struggling in his or her garret, you know. But well, what, I think what do you mean by sacrifice? What kind of sacrifice are you talking about? Well, I think it's um, you don't feel normal. I mean, as an artist, you you feel like. And a misfit and oddity because you feel from the left side of your brain and you have to function that all those the imagination your imagination becomes your intellect in a sense and uh, you have to you become a slave to that you're married to your passion you know what I mean and so I, I think true artist everything is secondary true artist and I and I had to learn I is didn't know that I was an artist until about five years ago. Is that feeling you know? of difference, does that have to do with just sort of the position that the arts have in American life? Is that No, I think it's the position the that it has inside of you. Okay. Because I think as an artist, you go, I feel this, I have to do this now. I have to dance. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, 
oh, well, we have to go. Well, I can't go. I have to feel. You know what I mean? I think, and actors are v artists. I, I think, think actors are the closest thing to artists because they just, they get into this inside place and they go. And, you know, as a creators, we have to use the other side of the brain to make sense out of that artistic vibe and put it on paper or communicate it to somebody else, you know. I think the people who succeed in theater especially are just not fit for anything else. <laughs> um, I mean, really, I think that that's the bottom mm -hmm. line. You're just not going to you're not going to succeed anywhere, so you might as well succeed here. You know, I, d I always say that about myself, what, when people say, well, what else would you do? And I go... No, so I think you can do other things like what will make you happy, though. I have to though. say, I don't also, I know some really quite brilliant actors, astonishing actors who go for years without working, or, and, you know, or who turn in a, an amazing performance and then have the critics dump all over right. it. I mean, so right. that there is... Yeah. And there's real, I, you know, but I know you a lot to, of actors. You have to who not go away. Right. I know, I know, but there is real uh, suffering. Well, I don't think it's that simple. Sacrifice. You have yeah, to absolutely. sacrifice. I don't think it's, no, don't think no, it's no. so no. simple that you have to not go away. Um, you, if it's a choice, then then the theater is not right. I mean, the right. the, the world is not. It's not like you're yeah. saying, well, now. Right. For a student, um, I think maybe I should go to medical school. Should I go to law school? Should I become a playwright? <laughs> you know. yeah, yeah, exactly. You, you don't, don't, you don't you do that. Do you know? However, there's a main difference with film. You can today say, should it be a doctor or a lawyer or a screenwriter? I'm smart. I can do it. I'll be a screenwriter. Yeah. That can be a very logical decision, and they may make a lot of money. It's a completely different kind of world from a playwright, from, from an actor. If you're an actor and you say, I think I'll be an actor because I'm going to be a star, uh, you you might be, but that's that's not the actors no. that I that's not that the I artists. respect. No. It's not the directors yeah. that you respect. Yeah. It's not there, there's no choice, and there's it's so scary being a playwright or being an actor. Uh, it's probably scary for an actor because you can get very bad reviews in a play in which you are doing what the director said, and you know it's wrong, but you are professional, so you're out there every night, and you gave a performance that you know you shouldn't be giving, but that's what you do, and you're out there. And for a playwright, reviews can be savage. They're like, why are you doing this? Why don't they kill this person? If this person ever shows up again, we, you know, how did this person... And if you may have a family or you have loved ones and you see this. And, and if, if you wither, get out, because it'll only get yeah. worse. Mm -hmm. You have to have a, 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 some invulnerable core that believes in what you're doing and says, this is what I do. And then you're okay. Through, through all that, because it is... That's the only way you get through it. The you have only to believe way. It. It's because the if you don't believe it in yourself as an artist or anything, there's so many things that pull you down. And that and is as where, a student, that's where another thing is, is, is being connected to other people who do the same mm -hmm. thing in some way. Mm -hmm. Writers Having have to community. know other writers. Having community and, and, and respecting other artists' work, being excited, thrilled by other artists' work. And, and when, when, when a fellow writer or actor is moved by your work, or an audience that you don't know, there's the juice. And the critics, when they come through, or the commercial success is an ancillary aspect. And if you luck out, you have a big success. If you don't, you don't. But you can't live for that. You can't depend on it. You can't believe that because it's successful, you're good. Other things happened. And, and well, because I think being an artist has nothing to do with having success. That's right. It's just being an artist. But that word, being an artist, I, I very, very personally, I have... I, 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 but I think most of the time I'm a fraud. <laughs> I mean, someone is going to actually find out mm -hmm. that actually what I'm passionate about, what I do and I love, mm -hmm. somebody's going to turn around and say, how did that happen? Because I feel a fraud most of the time when I well, think about Well, that's why you were such a great artist. <laughs> that's how it feels. Because it's all lies. Yeah, it's, it's a lie. We're all lying, lie. but you lie to, to... There are certain masks that hide you, and, certain, and some of those masks hide you, and other masks reveal you. And... and and I think it's a great teacher's nightmare. If someone's going to say you're a fraud, they're going to say you don't know what you're talking about. Well, you don't know what you're talking about, but you do. And that's where this is not logical. This is where you say there is a truth there, and that is what it's about. And somebody else says this is nonsense, and you can't argue with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. How so do you get into that? Yeah. They didn't like it. They didn't like it. Right. Right. Joey, what was that moment? You started to say uh, a moment ago when I interrupted you, but what, what was the, that moment when you discovered that you were ready, to, you wanted to be a choreographer, uh, that you were uh, I don't think I had any other dance. choice. You know, I was dancing, I got to dance with Jerome Robbins. Uh -huh. And after dancing that, you know, Jerome Robbins Broadway, it, it satisfied, so, satisfied, satisfied me on so many different levels. And, te and 
in, intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, um, and I got to experience levels of choreography that caused me to feel and act and emote and you know change my life. And I couldn't do step or change to the left anymore. I just mm. knew right there I can't do it. I can't do it. So I just said I needed to choreograph because I didn't want to wait till I was 45 and my dance career was over. You know I should still be dancing. Uh, timeline. I should I should be on doing my eight shows a week. That's what I should be doing. I should have been doing that for the past ten years. But instead, I shifted to choreography because I just had that feeling that I, I had that passion, that artist passion. And it wasn't until like about four years ago, after doing a few Broadway shows, that I finally went, "Oh, I'm an artist." It was like, "Oh, I started to care about the process and everything." Before you should just get them do some sta- steps. Oh, that's just fun. That's cool. People pay attention. <laughs> and then you finally learn, no, you can actually create out of nothing and move people and do st- storytelling. And that's why I was fascinated. That's why I asked a lot of questions of playwrights because I'm only now starting a new journey with collaborating with the, the creative side, with other creative people, as opposed to just going in, create a number, here, do a little entertain, da da. No, I want to I get into this room about, you know, not worry mm-hmm. about. And, not worry about what the critics say or how much money it's making. I want to create the art and discover that because I've lacked that level. And that's Did you have a mentor who, you know, sort of inspired you to do the work that you do? Or it sort of sounds like Robbins Jerry Robbins was, yeah. was your. Yeah. Can I ask a question, of everyone? Which would be, what is the most exciting part of what you do? Is it that's is a it question, in yeah. the rehearsal room? Is it when you're conceiving it? Is it when the piece opens and you see it works? Because I, I know what it is for me, and I know for most playwrights. So I'm not sure with and Teresa. What is that for you as a playwright? Uh, it's, it, it's, it's certainly it's not the play is open and it's a hit. It has nothing to do with, with that part. Um, probably the most exciting is in the writing when something is happening, or it can be in collaboration, when so, in, in rehearsal. When, when something has suddenly emerged, when it's collaborating, it's when... I no long, you no longer know who gave an idea or it's a line and an actor does something and then you see something you didn't see in the director and something happens there and you say, oh my God, look what that can do. Those are the magic moments. Or, magic or when moments I'm writing and suddenly yeah. it takes yeah. over and I say, wow. When you're not, it has not, then the piece is up and I say, oh, thank God, it resembles what I want and the audience has moved. But that feeling is very different for me mm-hmm. and, I, I, and I would think it's when you're, you're, you're not in control when something is on the right I think that's right. Track. You said the right word when you're not in control, which is very interesting because you think of being a director, being in control. But <laughs> actually, for me, I, I love the rehearsal process. That's, that's it. I mean, I could spend my life rehearsing. Um, and I, but there is that moment when something has happened and you don't really know how. You know, yes, you put all those forces into play, but all of a sudden it all comes together, and it's the music, it's the choreography, it's the, the, the words, it's the lyrics, everything just comes together, and it just well, it breathes. And that, I think, is, um, those are the magic moments. I think that it has, there's also a moment when that happens, and you're completely without ego. <laughs> so if you've written or you've directed or you're an actor, it's not logical. You can't explain right. how this happened. You right. knew you mm-hmm. did the preparation. Right. You've paid your dues. Something has occurred. Mm-hmm. It's not inspiration. You haven't sat around waiting for something to strike. And you did something, and, and you're an intermediary. You've discovered mm-hmm. something. You picked up something. Said, oh, and you were able to recognize what it was. And it happens. And, because, and then afterwards, it feels weird, because then you are praised, oh, you wrote a wonderful play, or you mm-hmm. cho- choreographed, mm-hmm. you yeah, directed yeah, yeah. it wonderfully. And right. in fact, when it was happening, I don't think that's what you're thinking. Fix you're mm-hmm. you're there with this group, and something is occurring that takes you out of your the chakras. Someone <laughs> asked me. Someone asked me about a moment in Sweeney Todd, and they said, "Well, how did you ever come up with that? How did you ever come up with it?" And I went, "I'm going to really disappoint you. I have no idea. It just happened." That's where some of the best ideas come from. Um, Moises, could you answer that question about that magic moment that um, Arthur is asking about? I don't know what. I think for me there are two moments. I was trying to debate because there are two moments that I think of when I think of those. One is just when, when I begin to think about a project and I begin to just mm-hmm. and I and I stop and I find myself not being able to think about other things. And when that kind of mm-hmm. devouring thing begins to occur, where your mind is, think everything that happens only reflects and references what you've been thinking about. That is thrilling. 
And the, the, but then, as e equally as strong is, I really have a, a great adoration of actors. I think that what actors do is just mm -hmm. astonishing. And when I am in, in a room with actors, I find myself always being elated. Even with a, when a scene is not working well, you, this, this crazy idea of somebody pretending to go through something mm -hmm. or pretending to be somebody else or devoting their life to this idea of what is our humanity fills me with such awe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just mm -hmm. being in room with actors is just, I, I don't know, it's a big thrill. I still, I still, like on the mm -hmm. first day of rehearsal or even in the, in the middle of the week, I'm, I'm, I'm like, oh my God. How you do that? <laughs> there, is, there is a deep bond between writers and other directors and actors, and you become the same person. They extend mm -hmm. you. They show you something about yourself. You are connected. It's not... It's a collaboration. It's, a, it, it's a, such a deep relationship yeah. that happens, and you together discover something. But what the actor does is awesome. When they, and, and when they're doing something that... They're giving you a gift. They, they, they become naked. They're, 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 they're on a tight rope and there's no safety net. I think it's also partially like giving birth because these people come together and it's like these things and this thing gets created. And e each moment when it happens in a rehearsal room or it happens in the pre-production between like writer, director, and choreographer or something or the musical director, you know, uh, which I... He's a, music directors are unsung heroes in musical mm -hmm. theater because I don't. No one's really aware of how much work they actually put into the creative process. But uh, you know, even when it happens on stage and the audience goes yay or they start crying, those little moments, it's like you've given birth to mm -hmm. something special. I it's alive. The That's Japanese director Yukio Ninagawa, and he he made the same reference. He said that the the playwright was like the father, and the actors were like the mother. And all the director was was kind of the midwife, kind of just, <laughs> just trying to just bring this thing carefully, yeah. carefully into the world. Um. How about you? Well, how that, that, what's that magic it's moment? It's very much the same. I mean, I actually really like it when you're in the room with them and something's not working. This is my favorite part. Yeah, mm -hmm. Something's not working, and then I can go, wait a minute, wait a minute. And you go, take that line out there. Do this, do that, and you just and and usually the actors know what you're doing well before the stage manager, the director, and they're like, well, "What are you doing?" And I'm like, "Well, don't it'll work." And then the actors all read it, and all of a sudden it goes. Mm -hmm. it's, right. it's so exciting. Mm -hmm. There was a moment when the Dramatists Guild two years ago had a um, a gala in the spring, and the event that they showed for the people who were there were series of what are called outtakes. <laughs> right, I was there. Uh, by, uh, <laughs> in, including a, a, an outtake from Fiddler on the Roof, the uh -huh. initial opening moment yeah. from West Side Story. Scene, Marsha Norman did one, David Henry Wang uh, did a scene, Arthur Miller did a, an outtake from, from The Crucible. And I was so proud to be a member of the Drama Guild and to be a playwright because every single one of those scenes was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And, and I thought, these writers absolutely without hesitation cut a scene that you would give your eye teeth to write. Not because the scene was no good, but because the scene didn't help the show in the long run. They knew, I wish that other playwrights could have seen what good writers cut from their pieces. You do it all the time. We do it correctly. Mm -hmm. You do it all the time. You, you, kill, your be, you kill your firstborn and your most loved. <laughs> <laughs> That's because a thing. If you're you a playwright or a family, director, you know, one throws off the boat so everyone can <laughs> make if it. You cannot you know? cut. <laughs> if you can't cut it out, this is not the business. That's You've right. got to be able to say, hey, I'll do it again. Mm -hmm. Doesn't help. Poof, it's, it's gone. Mm -hmm. now, I know Isabel has a question that she wants to ask. What does the theater offer us that no other media does? What is it that the theater offers live. us that we live. can't live. get? It's the time. danger of the live performance. Mm -hmm. It's never the same. It happens yeah. at that moment. And that there's high a wire act. Mm -hmm. The it's high wire act and the actor commit gives you something. If they're doing the job right, it is dangerous and it does something else. The audience completes the bond. Mm -hmm. right. The show doesn't happen without them. We can show a movie and one person can see it. I can see it by myself and I'll appreciate it. I, one person cannot see a play. This is a crowd, and this is what happens. Well, and I that bond happens, and the audience mm -hmm. completes it. It's why actors applaud the audience. I think it's, it's They're part of the production. The it's more primal. It's human yeah. nature. Right. It's, it's, I'm, I'm live, I'm a human, and the audience is a human, and together it's human behavior. It's like life. You know, it's, it's the caveman around the fire. It's dancing around the fire. Whereas we've gotten so technologically savvy, and we can, like, we can feel all these emotions alone by ourselves in a dark room, and we can create 
the wall of virtual everything. Virtual mm -hmm. everything. The sound can be so perfect. And I think what theater gives us now is we're so in need of human contact. And that's why um, I think theater will always survive because we can't recreate that. It's a mother, you can't recreate a, a mother's touch to the child. You can't create the family entity. And I think that's why theater is such a bond because we create family. Each show, we create a new family. We have to share and we have to love and we have to hate and you have and to be fight. dependent on each other. You have other to be dependent too. and I think that's what theater does. And we've created a little family here today with a little performance <laughs> today. We're just about out of time and I wanted to take this opportunity to thank this incredible panel for sharing their insights into the theater collaborative process with us today and to thank Isabel Stevenson for hosting us today. Thank and you. Uh, you have thank been watching. Thank all of you for being here. Oh, thank you. And you've been watching. It's really so exciting to have you here. You've been watching the American Theater Wings Working in the Theater seminars coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.